Mutant intruder neutralized. The name's Gambit, mon ami. Remember it. Hello and welcome to Tau Capes. I'm Cody Nestor. He's Todd Heal. Hey guys. Uh, Todd, just to start here, what what's your mutation? Is it is it excessive blinking? <laughs> you damn it, you're on to me. <laughs> uh, so Todd, we're here to discuss X Men ninety seven episodes five through seven. We uh, discussed the first four episodes of season one uh, a few weeks back. Uh, spoilers are ahead. So Todd, without going too deep right off the bat, what did you think of these three episodes? Uh, I think uh, episode five may be my favorite of the series. I mean, it's uh, as a singular episode, it's it's uh, it's it's great. Uh, six, uh, still strong, uh, uh, seven strong as well. Uh, I mean, this whole series, I mean, I would say other than that one segment where we had like the Jubilee video game stuff, which Mo the Motendo yeah, slash life death part one episode. Yeah. I mean, nothing terrible about that. It just kind of with the rest of what we've got, it just kind of seemed maybe a little off to me, but everything else, uh, spot on. Yeah. I mean, this is a, uh. This is definitely one of the best Marvel TV shows ever. It, you, one could argue it may be the best, just at least, you know, seven episodes now in. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I think there is a little bit of – it's a little – it can be a little roller coastery sometimes, right? Quality wise, in terms of not not so much the animation is top notch, the art, all that stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like, like an example like you used with like episode four with Motendo slash Life Death Part One, which is part one of a two parter that we don't come back to until two episodes later in episode six. Yeah, there's some decisions that have been made that could have been. You could have just had that being Life Death Part One, which we kind of got into that that before when we talked about Episode Four. That should just have been a standalone, a, a standalone yeah. Storm Forge episode. And then you know you go to the high highs of Five, you come down a little bit on Six, you go back up a little bit on Seven. So there's a little bit of roller coastering, but it's not yeah. severe. There's not a big drop. No big drop. It's off. Just, you go over a little hill, even out a little bit, drop a little, come back way up. You know those kind of things. Right. I would agree. Yeah. But yeah, I mean. I, uh, overall, like I'm loving the show, and like I think there's only going to be ten episodes in this season, so we're over already over halfway now. We only, only got, got what three left? Three left after this, yeah. So uh, yeah, so we're talking about five through seven. So let's go ahead and uh, start off with uh, episode five here. Uh, I believe it's called uh, "Remember It." Yes. Uh, where do you want to start with five? Oh, man, uh, where do you start with five? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess basically the crux of the whole episode is, uh, you know, the UN is now, you know, in an effort to improve uh, human-mutant relations. Uh, they decided to recognize Genosha as a nation, as a sovereign state. Yeah, uh, they are formally kind of admitting the, the nation of Genosha to the UN, I guess. Yeah. yeah. You've got that. Basically, it's, it's that story, and then kind of your B story is kind of what's going on back at the X Mansion. I think it starts off, you've got the report, or, uh, Trish Tilby. Yes. She's at the uh, X Mansion. She's interviewing the X Men. She's starting off with Beast and they're doing a little flirting. He he mentions, you know, blue blushes too kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but she's interviewing him. She'll eventually kind of interview Cyclops. Also around, Jean's there. She's kind of. Uh, she doesn't really want any part of it. She's still kind of, everybody's kind of recovering from what's been happening lately, obviously. Yeah. Scott's going through some stuff with having to, he lost Madeline, who he thought was Gene this whole time, the love of his life. She left. He had to give up his son, who's got a, a techno virus that he had to go into the, to the future with Bishop. Yeah. So he's obviously going through stuff. Gene's obviously been going through stuff because she's been kind of manipulated the hand of Sinister and not been able to actually live her life for uh, forever and has kind of been thrown back into the situation. And it, so there's a lot of kind of different dynamics kind of up in play. And then the A story, you've got Gambit, Rogue, Magneto, all taking the Blackbird, heading to Genosha to kind of meet with the, uh, the Genosha kind of counsel there yeah. kind of see how the other mutant half live basically and they kind of get there and it's kind of you see it at first it's very very idyllic 
you know, kind of rogue kind of uh, talks about how, you know, Magneto used to talk about a place like this, a place for mutants, you yeah. know, where you could thrive and be safe. And Magneto's brought in as many mutants as he can to Genosha. The Morlocks are there that he saved, I think, in episode maybe one or two even. I think I it's think, two. I think it's two, yeah. And uh, so you kind of see this kind of idyllic kind of uh, uh, mutant kind of paradise, really. That's what Genosha's kind of uh, set up to be. They get there and they meet – Immediately, they see Madeline Pryor, who I didn't think we were going to see again that quickly. Yeah, that's a pretty quick turnaround, yeah. Yeah, kind of coming off episode uh, three when she kind of takes off to leave to kind of forge her own destiny. But uh, she's back for episode five here, and she so she kind of found a home kind of rather quickly in, uh, in Genosha as well. We also see Nightcrawler. Yes. Always good to see Kurt Wagner pop up. Uh, yeah, literally. <laughs> literally <laughs> pop up, yeah. So it's kind of a little reunion for Rogue and Gambit and Nightcrawl a little bit there. Um, but yeah, Nightcrawler kind of shows Gambit and kind of rogue around and, uh, uh, Gambit kind of remarks that, uh, daddy's charging pretty high prices for the rent yeah. when he sees those, uh, was it $10 apples Oh yeah, yeah. around and Nightcrawler is like, no, no society's perfect. Everything kind of goes through their ups and downs. Uh, but why did the, the council really invite Magneto there, Todd? They were kind of wanting him to kind of be the forefront of this thing. They want him to be like, I guess their sovereign leader, kind of their king. Yeah. I think, uh, he meets with like the council who's made up of like a lot of, uh, old Hellfire Club members, it seems. Yeah. Like yeah. Sebastian Shaw there Emma Frost, Emma Frost. they want, and she she tells him that because Gambit and Rogue and Nightcrawl they've noticed all these like uh, pro Magneto propaganda posters all around mm -hmm. the the city of Genosha and she I think Emma Frost says that they want him to be like a poster child kind of king in a way they want him to be the figurehead of their new movement while they kind of pull the strings from behind right and really make the decisions and kind of work on the the day to day stuff uh, basically. Um, what uh, what's going on? What what does Magneto want though to do this time? He agrees to do. He it. agrees to do it, but only if uh, Rogue will be his uh, queen, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, do you want to kind of explain? We'll, we'll kind of jump ahead a little bit here. Do you want to kind of explain uh, the relationship? Because a uh, big part of the, the first. Uh, four episodes there's there's been this little kind of uh backstory because rogue and magneto obviously have a past together yes. it's being hinted at rather strongly she's kind of almost been torn in a way i guess you mm -hmm. would say between magneto and gambit now yeah. that he's kind of come back into the picture she eventually has a really great scene with i don't uh with uh gambit i'm not i'm no i'm jumping ahead here she has a really great scene where she kind of uh explains her past and a good setup for that too nightcrawler when they're kind of in the city uh he kind of uh talks to gambit and he's like encourage him he's like you know you need you need to marry her you need to make your move what are you waiting for you guys are obviously right. you know meant to be together but uh we get a great scene later on with her and gambit about kind of the relationship she has with magneto you want to take us through that so basically uh you know magneto kind of lets her know you know i want you to do this thing i want us to be together we can be you know the front of this thing you know we can be a you know a, a power couple mm, <laughs> basically right. And, you know, she's torn. She's conflicted. She has feelings for both. But, you know, in the end, she kind of takes the uh, needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And she kind of decides that she will become this queen and kind of, you know, help further mutant kind. But at the same time, she has to, of course, let Gambit down. They got to break it off. Yeah. And we <laughs> see she tells him her, her actual kind of backstory with Magneto, too. Like her, she says her evil mother kind of took her to Magneto yeah. when she was younger for him to kind of... Uh, Groom her. Yes. Let's uh, push that to the side a little bit. We, don't, we ain't going to touch on that yeah, much. Don't think too hard about this. But she says, you know, he was like, he was a, an idealist. He had ideas about mutant culture, mutant art, and he paints her like one of his French girls <laughs> and, and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And you see their backstory. Then they one day they discover there's, uh, there's a sort of magnetism between them, Todd. Uh, no pun intended. No pun intended. Yeah, actually, pun <laughs> pun very much intended. But yeah, the, she figures out his magnetic uh, kind of powers, his magnetic force field kind of around him at all times allows her to be able to touch him. So of course that means there's a bam, bad baby, bad <laughs> baby for uh, for a long time there. But she kind of sees uh, you know in the in the quieter moments that Magneto's a little he's a little scrambled up here too. Yeah. Obviously he's got some PTSD and some bad things that's happened to him from. His, uh, his upbringing as a, as a Jewish person and all the stuff that we've kind of seen from Magneto's background before with, you know, him being a Holocaust survivor and all this kind of stuff. So, again, we get some good information about Rogue and uh, Magneto's relationship. We also kind of further 
things a little bit between uh, Rogue and Gambit. And like I said, they have that really great scene where she does try to like tell him that she's going to do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of come back to that in a second. Jumping back to the, the X Mansion, I mean, really, it's still uh at this point kind of logan goes out and he finds gene hiding in her little like psychic bubble inside the lake oh yeah yeah and he's kind of talking to her and she's she's kind of regaling him with the story of of gene gray and scott summers at, at the same time scott's telling trish tilby about gene gray and scott summers yeah. about how they met gene talks about how they have this kind of psychic uh what is the word she uses uh she has they have a psychic i have it here in my notes somewhere uh, where is it, Todd? Where'd you put it in my notes? In your notes. I, I moved it around for you. <laughs> uh, a psychic. I can't find it. Jesus. Where is it? Uh, uh. This is all great content. <laughs> this is fantastic content. Please stand. Psychic by. rapport. Rapport. Yes, they have a. Yeah, so Gene, Gene says her and Scott have kind of a psychic rapport together. Um,. She ends up kissing Logan, just yeah. kind of in their little exchange. She's obviously still kind of searching for uh, the person that she's, who, who she was, who she's supposed to be, who she wants to be kind of now. So she's still kind of balancing those two True. two things. She also busts, so she kind of, in a way, cheats on Scott a little bit, and then she kind of busts Scott cheating on her. She kind of cheats physically with Logan by giving him a kiss, but meanwhile, Scott and Madeline are kind of having their little psychic rapport oh, yeah. from uh, from across time zones mm -hmm. together. And obviously, they're sharing a connection, and they're still kind of both grieving the loss of their son, uh, which is worse, Ty, the, the physical cheating or the mental cheating? Oh, man. Which which one's worse, mm. in your opinion, Ty? I mean, I, I, well, jeans was just a kiss. I mean, Cyclops <laughs> is like mentally linking up with another chick across the pond. Right. I mean, come on. All right. <laughs> I think they're both being a little hypocritical. Scott doesn't know about the kiss, so he's not really being hypocritical. True. But Gene's being a little hypocritical since he just, you know, smacked one on Logan outside. Um, but, uh, yeah, at this point, let's kind of go back to before we get into uh, – the uh, the disaster that strikes Genosha, which right. is really the big part of this episode. Um, we have that scene, that great scene with Rogue and and Gambit, and Gambit tells her that he respected that she never wanted to make things official, that he kind of played the swamp rat. She says she plays his share, <laughs> and uh, he says that, uh, uh, you know, she says, actually, that your heart may beat for me, but I can't feel it. You light up everything you touch, but never me. Oh. And Gambit says, uh, some things be deeper than skin share. So, like, just, again, just it's really great, great yeah. characterization of great, like, backstory and dynamics for their kind of relationship. How, like, they do have this connection that's been deeper than just the physical. But, uh, you know, there's obviously a warning there by both of them to, you know, explore things that they've never been able to. And I've, I've kind of heard people talk about... Um, like uh, with their relationship and the way it's kind of set up. And in this X-Men universe that you're setting up now in this show, there's those, uh, the power restraint collars. Oh, just yeah. get one of those for 10 minutes. Yeah. And just, you know, mm, <laughs> you know, work some stuff out, you know, just have a little, have yeah. a little collar on your bedside table. You know what I mean? Hmm. Problem solved. But anyway, Man. that's, that's a little, that's a little nitpick. That's a little, uh, going in the weeds a little bit too much there. Uh, but yeah, so she, she tells that her and Gambit kind of have an agreement to kind of, he thinks to kind of be friends and, you know, she's going to go off and do her thing with Magneto. And she, then she proceeds to like cuckold him in public with Magneto <laughs> as she's got on this nice gown and they fly and dance around at a party while, uh, I think it's Ace of Base is playing in the background, which is a good, which is a good choice. It actually, the, the way that song goes is actually, uh, pretty great. Right. But then she tells Magneto, eh, thanks, but no thanks. I, I do like Gambit and some things are, are deeper than skin. And then, uh, right about that time, Madeline gets a little psychic kind of a strike. Psychic hit, yeah. Yeah, a little strike. And we see Cable uh, arriving just in time to try to warn everyone. Hey, turn the music off, shut the fucking party down. <laughs> Something's coming. Yeah. And uh, right before Cable's kind of pulled back in time, you know, we see Madeline kind of discover that he is uh, Nathan Summers. Mm -hmm. He's the her, her son and Scott's son. And that's when all hell breaks loose. All time. hell breaks loose. You take us through that. What happens here? So we've got some kind of new, obviously updated master mold. I think that thing was like three headed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Gambit calls it a vile Godzilla Sentinel. Yeah. Is what Gambit kind of calls it, and that's that's really the a good term for it. It's like a kaiju kind of size, mm -hmm. three headed, gigantic Sentinel. I mean, this thing is like you know bigger than the city. It's bigger than any Sentinel you know yeah. we've ever kind of seen. 
It's just raining down destruction. It's just, uh, you know, carnage left and right. Yeah, it's taking out mutants. I mean, there's a lot of background mutant characters that I, I, some I know, some I have no idea who they right. are. We see people getting blasted out of the sky. Uh, you know, there's there, officially, I should have kind of went through. I don't have like an official, we'll kind of see some people that survived and didn't survive as we kind of go through the other episodes. But there's quite a few people that uh, that get destroyed in, in this kind of episode. And then uh, the, really the, the crux of it is it's still centered around Magneto, Gambit, and Rogue. A big part of it, Gambit says, uh, the Morlocks are kind of trapped in one area. Um, Gambit, Magneto, Rogue, they're all trying to kind of save as many people as they can. Magneto says, you know, let's save everybody we, we can we, yeah. in the morning. We won't, we don't want to have any regrets about what we tried to do and how many we saved. Uh, Nightcrawler, he's kind of taken out of the action. He was kind of teleporting people out. He gets kind of taken out of the yeah. action as well. Um, but at one point, Magneto tries to protect the Morlocks and Leech from like the the gigantic blast from the uh, the Sentinel Kaiju Sentinel yeah from the Kaiju <laughs> Sentinel and he protects Rogue and Gambit as well because he takes some metal and like kind of a uh, clamp stem I don't know like a light pole or something to kind of get them out of the blast yeah. area and then we see kind of Rogue and Magneto have that kind of last look and then it's a really great moment too because it's set up earlier in the season where Leech. When Magneto kind of rescues the the Morlocks, he he kind of tells Leech and the Morlocks, you know, you don't ever have to be afraid again. Yeah. And then Magneto kind of looks at him as he, Magneto knows what's about to go down, and then Jeremy tells him, "Don't be afraid." Like just, mwah, just oh, just yeah. good stuff. Like, and then also during the episodes, sometimes not only in Rogue's backstory, but during these moments, we kind of see, you know, he's having flashbacks. Magneto is to like the Holocaust and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just so such good writing, such good character development so many layers that we're kind of bringing in here and like we're kind of getting to really focus on characters that we didn't normally focus on before in the show as much you know like that's a, a thing that I've, I've heard some other people point out something that kind of bring up like i thought with this show like it would be a lot of like what we saw with the fox x-men where it was just like very wolverine centric right you know what i mean mm -hmm. he's been mostly a side character he's not really done much of he's anything he's not really took the forefront of anything uh, anything yet. really this this season so far has been about developing cyclops and kind of giving him some some uh you know some development and letting him kind of shine now that xavier's gone it's been a lot of Rogue. Now we're getting some Gambit set up, a mm -hmm. lot of Magneto set up. Like it's really, it's really, refreshing to see. It really is. It's like it's moving us forward. A storm as well, which we'll talk yeah. about. But it's kind of moving that forward and just moving some of these characters forward that don't get as much focus normally. And it's been, I think, the season has been has been better served for it. But uh, Magneto can't hold back the Kaiju Godzilla blast, so it ends up blasting them away. And then at this point, Rogue is just she's pissed. She's pissed. She's pissed. She takes off after the Sentinel uh, Gambit. He saves her. I think he slings his motorcycle into her I think, to, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to knock her out of the way. And uh, Todd, take us through the last little fight here. Gambit versus Godzilla Kaiju Sentinel, Todd. So he goes in uh, for the kill, gets as close as he can, uh, gets impaled. Yes. And, uh, you know, the last thing he does is he takes and grabs a hold of the instrument that impaled him and sends his kinetic charge through it, blowing up the Kaiju Sentinel. Yeah, that's when we get the line of the show. He says, the name's Gambit, mon ami. Remember it obviously the name of the show yeah. and Gambit kind of charges himself and the Sentinel and kind of destroys them both. And it's, I mean, it's for Gambit fans, which I'm a fan of Gambit. I love Gambit. Like it is, it's bittersweet because you feel like this is the end yeah. and, but it's also what a way to kind of go out. Oh yeah. And this, you know, um, to, to not jump ahead too much, this, that last fight, I know we're kind of going through, we can't really do it justice. If you haven't watched episode five, like, and you're a fan of Marvel, you're a fan of X Men, like it's required viewing. Oh, yeah, point. definitely. Like, it is, I think, the single, if the show itself isn't the best Marvel TV show ever, at least in the new, let's say, MCU era of Marvel television against like What Ifs and the Captain America and the Winter Soldiers and the She Hulks and all that of the world animated in live action together. If it's not the best Marvel TV show of the new MCU era ever, that episode is the best. Oh yeah, a single episode Definitely, of any Marvel yeah. TV show ever. Like ever. it is, it is epic, and it, it's 
At first, you think it's just a little episode where it's just a side story of Magneto and Rogue and Gambit just going to Genosha and playing politics and setting up some stuff for later on in the season, maybe, and introducing some some side characters and some mutant background yeah. characters and a lot of like, oh, who's that? Oh, look, cool, Emma Frost here, Sebastian Shaw's here, little cameo stuff. Yeah. And that's what kind of makes it so good is you spend – a lot of times just thinking this is just a normal kind, kind of, of a filler almost filler maybe. episode <laughs> exactly and then it turns into the most like devastating piece of x-men media maybe we've ever seen yeah. and it's just it's just fantastic and the last kind of shot of the uh the episode is is rogue is holding gambit's dead body she's kind of touching his cheek she's she, has, she does have her glove on from where her and Magneto were cuck holding him before, dancing <laughs> right. around, and she's like touching his cheek, and she says, "You know, she says, uh, sugar, I can't feel you." Yeah. And it just kind of ends on that black screen, her crying, like, "Oh, it's just, it's so good." I it's mean, a gut wrencher. And the, again, the animation is top notch. Everything that's done, the, the the setting of the destroyed city, the way it looks, like the red sky, like the ambiance of it. You know, Gambit running around in his like fine white suit. Yeah. You know, it like it's it's all just it's badass. I mean, it really is. It's 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 the best single Marvel television episode ever. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong. I think even the end credit to that episode, the usual end music is not there. It's like a somberish tone. Yeah, it's like a yeah. I think a, like a, to- a somber kind of version of the the X Men theme, like kind of like a, a slow yeah. version of it. Yeah, like it's so all, they did it right. They did, they it, did right. it right, and it's like you know. And, uh, you know, we don't know where it's all going. Again, we got three episodes left, and some of this may get retconned when you have Cable and Bishop and you have Time Travelers. Yes, some of this yeah. may be retconned. Will this stick? You know, for this episode to kind of jump ahead, Gambit is for sure dead. Yeah. You know, Gambit is gone, but may he come back some way. Maybe we get another alternate universe Gambit. Maybe there be some time travel shenanigans. Possibly. Right. We don't know yet, but... If it sticks or if it doesn't, it still doesn't uh, take away from the impact of this episode because, like, it sets up the stage for some 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 major stuff to go on. And it's just like I said, I can't really say. Like, I watched it and I mess I messaged you for days. I'm like, have you watched episode five yet? <laughs> have you watched episode five right, yet? Right. Like, you need to watch episode five. Like, it's just again, it's it's to me, it is the single best. Marvel television episode of anything ever. Yeah, yeah I can't not agree. Old with that. era, new era. Spider-Man animated series, original and X-Men animated series, all the new MCU shows, the What If show, like all of it, everything considered, it's still the single best episode of any any Marvel property ever. Yeah, I gotta agree with that. Um, but uh, I think for for this one, it, again, it sets up some things that we'll see kind of later on, and and what's going on here. We have the time travel element. We obviously have cable. Lots of things. Um, and, uh, you know, lots of actual meaningful people that did actually die here. True, true. Like, I'm pretty sure Sebastian Shaw got wiped out. Mm-hmm. You know, like, it, there, there's quite a few actual, you know, real deaths. And will, yeah. they, will they stick? We don't know. We don't know. We yet. don't know. So, Todd, uh, let, let's kind of give uh, each episode of these three kind of their own review score. So, uh, I think I know where you're going. Maybe not. But what is your review score for episode five? Uh, you know, I just got, I got to cause it as I seize it sometimes. And uh, this is a nine for me. This is amazing. Okay. I mean, as far as a single episode of an animated series or even not animated series, uh, you know, if you know me or don't know me, I, you know, I'm a Batman the animated series guy all day, every day. But, uh, this will push some of that. This this was a good this is a good episode right here. It's it's the best so far. Yeah, for sure. And I mean it's a good example of why, you know, this show is it's it's come back after so many years. It's kind of we've talked about before, it's it's a show that it doesn't dumb it down for kids. It's a show that is it's it's watchable and enjoyable for children it's enjoyable for adults obviously i think it's more geared towards people in our age group people that remember the original show and kind of grew up with it or were watching it at the time like as far as like a a faithful kind of reinvention of the show and then also like moving it forward i don't think you really could ask for much better at this point the writing is so strong the animation is so strong Uh, i didn't quite know where you're going i thought you were giving it a 10 okay you must (laughs) you're a tough grader todd you're a tough (laughs) reviewer me i give it a 10 out of 10 i think this is a 10 out of the 10 episode I, i i don't think it can really get much better again 
some people argue like, well, you know, I want to see, I want to see more of the fight and more like, right. you know, like this without that setup, without it almost kind of feeling like a filler episode, the impact of it is is, is heightened so much more. It wouldn't because have hit as hard, yeah. yeah, because you don't expect it. It literally comes out of nowhere in the last. 10 minutes of the episode maybe the last eight minutes or so of the episode and it just it it, it comes in it just it hits you like a brick wall and then it's just it's you're, you're done and you're left yeah. to be like what the fuck just happened right what the fuck just happened so for me it's a 10 out of 10 i can't say it's the best marvel tv episode ever and not give it a 10 out of 10 oh you're right you're right so i'm gonna give it a 10 out of 10 uh anything else about episode five before we move on to six i think i'm good buddy <laughs> All right. Uh, so episode six, I believe that is called, I think that is Life, Death, Part Two. Yes. We have a uh, A story, B story, A story. Xavier and what's going on with him, because Charles Xavier is still alive in this universe. And then we have our B story, uh, which is Storm and Forge. And we kind of saw that set up uh, before in Life, Death, Part One, which is in that Motendo filler right right double yeah. episode kind of thing yeah. that should have should have never been it should have just been life death <laughs> part one yeah. that should have been the full episode for our thoughts on that if people haven't watched our original video uh the jubilee stuff was fine it was mediocre to fine mm -hmm. the the real the, the thing that suffered was storm and forge's relationship the one other problem the show has is that we kind of it's ten episodes, so like we kind of speed through some stuff sometimes. Yeah. The development, you all right over there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Them sausage muffins I'm, coming back on you, boy. I'm good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the Storm and Forge episode, uh, their relationship kind of gets like it, they go from like, "Hey, I'm Forge. Nice to meet you, Storm." To come back to my house. To I love you. <laughs> Very quick. Very quickly. Like it just goes through that. That that was kind of our our criticism of episode four. In this one, we see that play out because at the end of that episode, uh, that that uh, that part, uh, Storm and Forge were kind of set upon by a, a classic X Men enemy called the Adversary. Yes, kind of like this demonic kind of spirit, I would say. So uh, we'll go kind of through what happens here. I'm gonna let you take us through Xavier and what's kind of going on with him, and I'll go through Storm and Forge. So let me just. I think the Xavier stuff is more the meat of the show, so I'll I'll kick us off with uh, Storm and Forge here, okay? And then I'll let you take us through Xavier. Um, but yeah, like I said, Storm and Forge are kind of set us, uh, upon by the adversary, and uh, the last time we see them, Forge is kind of bitten on the shoulder yes. by the adversary, and this has kind of left him in a state where he's kind of been poisoned. So Storm's trying to care for him, and also the adversary is kind of messing with her mind. Um, kind of uh setting up this kind of these kind of surreal kind of scenarios you don't what's reality what's not reality there's portions of it where she's like being trapped she's like shown being in a coffin mm -hmm. it's like antagonizing her yeah. telling all this stuff that she may believe in her own mind it's really just trying to to mess with her mind and to make her second guess herself and obviously to not worry about forge and what's going on with him forge does kind of break out of his uh his poisoning long enough to uh, kind of use some like some kind of magical book or something that his mom or grandma had. Look very Doctor Strange. -ish, yeah, he? yeah, exactly. <laughs> he uses like uh, you know a book uh, kind of to kind of ward off the evil spirits uh, that kind of been passed down from his family. So we get the adversary kind of going away for a minute, so him and Storm, Storm can kind of have a little a uh, little moment together. And he basically tells her, you know, uh, I'm dying. Uh, I need this herb. Uh, there's a herb that, that grows out somewhere in the desert. Yeah. I'm going to go get it. She's like, obviously, you're, you're in no shape to get it. I'll go get it. Uh, he and her take off on horseback. They go to uh, kind of find this cave where it's supposed to be growing. I think he, there's there's a little shot where it's like, what is it, like old Civil War cavalry rounds? Yeah. They're yeah, kind of yeah. like stuck in that cave and like, you know, some good little setup and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, a big part of the episode, the big thing Storm kind of has to face is he kind of shows her like, hey, to save my life and to go get this herb, you got to crawl through this little dark ass little hole. <laughs> and the thing about Stormy is she's obviously claustrophobic. She's claustrophobic. So yeah. a lot of this episode is dealing with for her and getting to that herb is kind of facing her fears, coming to the realization of what's going on. So she's kind of climbing through this little 
cavern, these little holes, dealing with their claustrophobia. Meanwhile, the adversary is like, what are you doing, huh? <laughs> like, are you lying to yourself? <laughs> like that kind of stuff, you right. know what I mean? Like Messing just, with just her. Just messing with her, fucking with her the whole time. And she kind of realizes that she's been um, kind of lying to herself, like denying her powers. And then she kind of discovers this, and it kind of uh, unlocks her powers again. I mean, we really get this really – uh, awesome moment, kind of similar to episode one where you see that Storm is an Omega level mutant. Oh, yeah. And when her powers come back, you see her fly off into the atmosphere. She gets a new costume. It's one of those like hand wave things where it's like somehow you can magically manifest new attire for yourself. It's kind of that classic uh, black and yellow or black and gold. Yeah. Not my face. Kind of like, yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't yeah. know if it's ultimate X-Men ish, I'm not sure. Yeah. But something online, yeah, she she dons the black outfit. Uh the hair is a little bit different. It's long, but it's straighter now. Mm-hmm. Before it's kind of flowy and a little bit, you know, kind of curly. Yeah. But uh yeah, she has this great scene where she's flying to the upper atmosphere. She comes back down. She's like flying with wildlife and animal life everywhere. It's very um Honestly, it reminded it was very much uh it gave me like a man of steel vibe. Remember the first yeah. time he takes off and he, he comes flies, back down and yeah. he's flying with wildlife and animals and yeah. stuff. Very man of steel. I don't know if that's the vibe they were going for, but I mean it, it's appreciated even even if it wasn't. But yeah, we see her new powers. Uh so you're a you're a black costume over a white costume. I always preferred that black costume. That's just my personal opinion. I, I can't I can't <laughs> I can't blame you. I mean it lo- it looks badass. But yeah, we get that uh we get that little great scene. She ends up getting the herb. She goes back to uh her and Forge kind of go back to his place. She puts the bomb on Forge. Who told her to put the bomb on, Todd? <laughs> Did I tell her to put the bomb on? <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of thing. She puts the bomb on Forge. But uh, anyways, Forge kind of flips on the TV and they kind of learn about the tragedy of what's going on in Genosha. Right. And uh, uh, we kind of maybe a hint that Storm's going to rejoin the fight now. Maybe Forge is coming along with her. So that's kind of where we leave off with Storm. Just to kind of surmise it a little bit, um, I would have liked really honestly to see both of those episodes, Life, Death, Part 1 and 2, been their own self-contained exactly, episodes. Exactly, yeah. Get rid of the Jubilee stuff, have Life, Death, Part 1. I'll talk about my feelings about the Xavier stuff when you take us through it. But uh, it's... Um, it's just something it should have been more drawn out. It should have been two standalone episodes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It should have been a true part one and a part two, and it should have just been focused on that. Like I think Storm is such a, a major character, not only in the X Men, but for this series, and you're kind of uh she was kind of uh pushed to the curb a little bit in the old show. And you've done really good, like in episode one, kind of setting her up and kind of bringing her back into this and to kind of not fully give her a, a couple shows to develop this yeah. from losing her powers to gaining them back is a little bit of a disservice, but you know, it is, it is kind of what it is, but I would have rather seen two actual, you know, parts of this episode. Uh, so take us through what's going on with old Chucky Xavier, Todd. So we, we open in space yes. and we see a battle going on between the Shi'ar and the Kree empire. Yes. Uh, we got Ronan the accuser yeah, Ronan. and uh, we've got, uh, I think it's princess Lalandra's sister. Is it death, death bird? bird? Yes. Yeah, death bird. And so she gives Ronan and his crew a pretty good beat down. I like the design of Ronan yeah, too. Yeah. It was pretty nice. And, uh, she kind of gets a message that, you know, something's up with her sister. And uh, what it is is her sister has announced that she's going to wed uh, Earthman Professor Charles Xavier. <laughs> Professor Noted. X is alive. Noted cripple. Yeah. Charles Xavier. <laughs> but actually in this, in the, the space, he has some kind of cybernetic leg attachments yeah, he can like use. Yeah, exoskeleton Yeah, kind of exoskeleton thing. suit. He can actually walk. Uh, so the plan is Princess Lalandra is going to marry Charles. They're going to live happily ever after up there in the she ever after <laughs> up there in the Shi'ar Empire. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we do get some kind of nice stuff between uh, Charles and Lalandra. You know, she kind of notices that he's kind of, you know, feeling a little homesick. He's mm-hmm. missing his X-Men. He's missing his old charges back on Earth and... He's like, well, you know, what would be the harm of just going and checking in on him, you know? And she's like, well, you know, we're family. You check in, you tend to get caught up, you tend to stay. Exactly. <laughs> and he's kind of trying to convince her, well, maybe we should consider Earth. Maybe we could maybe, you know, live down there. Maybe you don't have to live up here. I want to live. <laughs> it's like the South Park song. <laughs> Meanwhile, Deathbird shows up, and uh, she's not happy with the pending nuptials, mm-hmm. and uh, she's not happy with the whole situation. And she's got, you know, her own designs for the princess's throne, so 
she's like, you know, I can set forth this task to you, and I charge you, Charles Xavier, to renounce earth and renounce all of your earthly memories, including your precious X-Men. And I think at one time she calls earth the uh, Milky Way ghetto. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she does. Yeah, she she does say something yeah. about he wants to eat pies for his Milky Way ghetto yeah, so and stuff. We are the yeah. Milky Way ghetto. Love course. it. <laughs> Love it. I want to put that on my uh, bumper sticker. And there was another little thing where Charles is walking out with Lalandra, and you know, he says something about it. That I think they think I'm your pet or something. And she's like, you know, you know, simmer down, Charles. You'll have plenty of time to bark later. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> just, just, just little stuff for yeah. adults, little nuggets for adults. And uh, one of the things, uh, too, that she set forth is Lalandra has to be the one that removes all these memories and stuff from Charles' mind. So, you know, she's got them both, you know. Obviously, she thinks Charles is not going to do his part, and, and Lalandra is not going to remove those memories from him. So, she, you know, Warbird's pretty much, not Warbird, but Deathbird has got her designs on the throne. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing about Lalandra, I don't mean to interrupt you. Like, I just, I just love the fact that I, I, I remember Lalandra and the Shi'ar and stuff from like the the original series, but um, I just, I forgot that like Lalandra, she has that kind of like weird helmet. You going with her hair? It's her yeah. helmet. <laughs> It's one of those examples. She takes off her helmet at one point, and yeah. I'm like, her hair is literally her helmet. Yeah. I'm like, wow. What? Talk about the ultimate case of her helmet hair. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's Princess Lalandra. Yeah, I wanted to put that in there, though. So at some point, uh, Charles uh, mentally takes them all into, I think he says, the astral astral plane, mm. and he's kind of taking them to school. He's got an old chalkboard behind him, and, you know, he's got them in, you know, classroom chairs. And, he's back in the green suit. Yeah, he's trying, you know, to lay down the law, let them know, you know, you know what their problems is, you know, the problem with the Shi'ar Empire. As he's going through all that, he gets another psychic impulse, and he sees Gambit, and then he sees Gambit's kind of corpse, and he realizes what has happened on Earth. And when he realizes that, everything else that was happening up there is over. Yeah. Marriage, nuptials, the whole shebang. He's coming home, folks. He's coming home. <laughs> yeah, I love the the line he says. He's like, no. He's like, they were dancing, drinking wine, making love. Oh, my children, my children, the Adam destroyed. Like, yeah. I love that line. And that's kind of where we end up with Xavier as well. He, it's like... He he's he also just like Storm and Forge, they're bring they're seeing what's going on in Genosha and we see, you know, kind of Xavier learning for the first time what's going on. But that last kind of line and that last scene, like you said, Gambit turning from Gambit to skeleton gambit. Yeah. The the people that were there in the class, they're all skeletons. Mm-hmm. You know, they look like skeletons as well. Like very, very good imagery, very strong stuff for that episode overall. Uh for me, I don't I don't know, like this is this might bring me some hate, but uh, I don't. It's not that I'm not a. It's not that I'm not an Xavier fan. It's not that at all. But like, um, just kind of looking at the structure of the show and where we're at with the show, I kind of wish Xavier was really dead. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. This might get me some hate, but I kind of just wish that Xavier was actually dead. I think that dynamic that you set up on the show with the X Men having to fend for themselves in a world without Xavier is more interesting than him existing in just yeah. a Professor X led world. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think it sets up more interesting stuff when they're just kind of, they're having to figure it out as a go. And it's and a lot of it's on Cyclops' shoulders. And maybe now Xavier's kind of coming back in the fold because maybe Cyclops, you know, he has a little bit too much on his shoulder, but I kind of wish Xavier was really dead. <laughs> I don't know that's bad to say, but like, right. you know, I'm interested to see how this show is going to treat Xavier because, um, the 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 big problem with the movies the the Fox X Men universe is like you've got to take Xavier out of out of it early on you got to put him on the sideline somehow because he's just too powerful too powerful yeah so you always had him like getting sidelined somehow and like you got to you got to take him out of the equation right so I'm interested to see how they're they're going to use Xavier is he just going to come back and just kind of be Kind of what he was on the original show, just kind of there. And yeah. there's some Xavier centric episodes, and he does some things, but he's mostly just there. And he's, you know, kind of the spiritual leader and things like that of the X Men. But like, are they going to give him some stuff to do? I guess is my core. Is he going to have like some stuff to do other than like, I'm back? Right. And then <laughs> just go sit in his wheelchair in Westchester? Yeah. Like, that's my question. Like, what are they going to do with the character? But like, yeah. there is a part of me that's kind of wish, like, eh, should be dead. He should have just stayed. He should have. You should have stayed dead, Xavier. <laughs> yeah, like that kind of thing. But I'm, I'm interested. Like again, I might get some hate for that. But it, it I, my my opinion can be swayed depending on what they do with that character. Yeah. 
Oh, we should mention too the the final scene we get. We see uh, old Oliver Trask. He's kind of running around. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And we kind of hear Mister Sinister in the background. Mm. Uh, he tell he's saying that you know he's telling Mister Sinister uh, he gave him you know why are you doing this? I gave you my DNA to access Master Mold. Uh, Mister Sinister tells Trask to not fret the future. Why Genosha was merely the beginning of a prologue now past. You have nothing to fear so long as you place your faith in Sinister. Ah. Again, some again setting up Mister Sinister. He's kind of been the foil in the background mm-hmm. of uh, the first six episodes to this point. He yeah. was heavily seen in episode three. Now back in episode six, but he's, he's been he's been kind of set up as our big bad. Uh, what did you think about episode six, Todd? All uh, all in all, Storm and Forge and Xavier. Uh, rating wise, I would have probably have to give this one a seven. It's a good solid episode. I mean, for episode six to really, you know, knock it out of the park after episode five, I, I, I didn't see it happening here. Yeah, you needed a, a buffer episode. Yeah, you, I didn't. It's okay not to go right back into like you needed to kind of come back s- down a little bit, live with that, and sit with that a little while. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't no, mean to cut you I off. I mean, you know, it's it's just a good, solid episode. You know, you know, we set up that Charles is still alive. He's alive and good. He's coming home. Yeah. Uh, we get uh, the finale of Storm's life, death arc. She's got her powers back. She seems to be coming back. So, I mean, you know, it's a good uh, moving to plot forward episode. Like I say, coming down off episode five, you can't really take another gut punch. Yeah. So, I, I mean, you know, as far as a good, solid episode, I think that's what it is. This That was true. For uh, an episode that's, that's that to follow episode five, it does the job well enough to say that it, it's not just a spin your wheels filler episode. Right. It does advance some stories. We do get to see what's been going on with Xavier. We do get the conclusion of Storm's kind of arc with her losing her powers and then setting them up to join the other mutants in Genosha after yeah. what's been going on. So it does a good job there. For me, uh, I think it's a little uh, a little weak in places. I'm going to give it a six out of ten which is in, in that decent range. Uh, again, Charles Xavier, I wish he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hot take for today. That's the hot take, folks. Charles Xavier, a corpse. A corpse. Uh, so episode seven, I do not remember the name of episode seven right off, so forgive me for that. But we start off with Gambit's funeral. Yeah. Um. Again, for 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 this show, uh, lots of strong stuff. Night Nightcrawler's giving his eulogy. Mm-hmm. I like that Nightcrawler kind of references Gambit's fear of his own powers because that's kind of been Gambit's. You know, he he had he was he he modified himself and his body to lessen his powers because he was kind of scared of what. Yeah, what could happen in right. the, the 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 kind of breadth of his powers? Uh, he says Gambit had endless faith in in potential, yet he seems so blind to his. Every gambler has a tail. Modesty was Gambit's. Come on now, yeah, come know. on. <laughs> I mean, it's really again it's good impactful stuff. And Nightcrawler being the one to give the eulogy while the other X Men are there, it's it, it's great. It's perfect. Mm-hmm. It's perfectly set up. Uh, who's missing from the funeral, though? Well, there's one that's not there, and that's Rogue. Rogue is not there. Jubilee is kind of upset. She's kind of she's kind of consoled by Logan a little bit because she says she should have been here, meaning Rogue. Rogue's not there. Rogue is kind of uh, she's too busy with her mission. Yeah, she, she's gone, Rogue. She's, <laughs> yeah, she's gone, Rogue. So she's looking uh, for Gyrick. So she hopes Gyrick can get uh, her to Trask. Right. Uh, she busts into a secret military base. Uh, General Ross cameo there, Todd. Yeah, old Did Thunderbolt you? Ross. Uh, yeah. Uh, he he's kind of not threatening at uh, fretting at the uh, at the start of it because he's like, oh, this place was meant to contain the Hulk. What's some? Uh, I think he said some mutant from the swamp or something like that going to do. <laughs> uh, and then she busts in, of course. Yeah. Uh, she busts in and kind of gets some information and from him. Meanwhile, B story. Uh, the rest of the X Men they're heading to Genosha. They want to go there. Want to show up to let the people, the mutants, know the X Men are there. They care about the situation. They're also there to try to help, to try to clean up, look for survivors, right. all that kind of stuff. So they're kind of uh, – that's kind of the B story is them on Genosha. Uh, with Rogue, she's again going around. She ends up some snowy cabins. And who she meet at the snowy cabins, She runs Todd? into Captain America. Captain America. Now, I know, awesome. <laughs> I know this was kind of, you know, kind of teased in the little, you know, what's to come next episode, mm-hmm. you know, next time on X-Men kind of thing. Uh Captain America, again, a lot of the later seasons, uh, I think it's like season five or so of the original X-Men run, uh, brought in a lot of, like, other Marvel characters. Yeah, it was yeah. like kind of like almost cameo of the week stuff. So I know right. 
Cap kind of featured heavily, but he kind of comes back in here. Uh, Cap is also wanting to use Gyrick to find Trask. Uh, he tells her that the UN secretly transferred him out of U.S. custody. He says their hands are kind of tied in regarding uh, you know, bringing in Trask. And I love that Rogue tells him since his hands are tied, he won't be needing his shield, and she throws it like 10 miles away. Yeah, she just flings it away. And then Cap is standing there like, this bitch. This bitch. Did I got to go walk my ass. I got to go hunt for that son of a bitch. I hope he's, <laughs> I hope he's got that, like, uh, Captain America motorcycle, like in that old Captain America movie. Yeah. Like, that old motorcycle helmet. <laughs> Let me go get my shield back. Yeah. Remember it was clear back in? It looked like a Frisbee oh, when he God. throwed it. Oh, Come on. <laughs> Folks, if you not ever saw the old 1970s, like, I think it was a TV movie, Captain America, good yeah. God. Yeah, good God. Do yourself a favor. Just watch it for a laugh. <laughs> or don't. <laughs> or don't. <laughs> Google some clips. You'll see what we're talking about. Um, a, a character that gets a, a few good scenes in this episode is Beast. Beast yes. has some good, good, good scenes here. Uh, Trish Tilby, she shows up on... Uh, on Genosha, mm-hmm. she's not really so much worried about reporting it as she is just kind of being there. And her and Beast have a little dynamic, a little relationship. I think there's a little something maybe brewing there, yeah, maybe. Yeah, a little flirtation going on. But he's got some good scenes uh, with her on Genosha. He's just going around quoting Mr. Rogers, <laughs> quoting Mo- Martin Luther King. Uh, but good, good it's Beast good stuff. stuff yeah. Good Beast stuff. Uh, we're jumping around a lot here, but Rogue, uh, she goes to, she learns from Cap and everything going on. She heads to Mexico. She finds Gyrick living it up in his prison which is kind of like this this uh, it's like a resort yeah it's like a villa kind yeah. of thing uh did you know uh Garrick was a lepidopterus no what would you call him <laughs> uh a lepidopterus Todd. he collects butterflies oh oh yeah, yeah the butterflies yeah that's a 10 cent word right there yeah yeah, yeah. yeah he's my he, five cent head couldn't <laughs> comprehend but carry yeah, on <laughs> i was i was literally watching the episode again last night and i'm like i'm on my phone like what's it called when you collect butterflies <laughs> and i'm like oh let me put this word <laughs> in butterfly here. fetish what is that <laughs> Butterfly kink. And then I went right down a rabbit hole, and uh, it was 3 a.m., and I was covered in stuff before I knew it. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, yeah, I put that word in here, and I, pop, I probably butchered it. But that's what it's called, folks, if you're ever wondering. Uh, but, yeah, Rose, she takes off her gloves. Uh, she starts sucking away on Gyric, on Gyric uh, seeing what's going on, getting it you know, straight from his, uh, his dome. Uh, again, jumping around back on Genosha, uh, we find Emma Frost. Yeah, she's alive and well. She's alive and well, and Beast kind of remarks that uh, you know, kind of the stress she kind of discovered her ability for diamond transmutation uh, to kind of save her life in the attack. Something that she never, I, I believe, she never, she never did that in the original show. Like this is that she was just kind of a telepath. Yeah. This is the first time we see kind of her diamond transmutation yeah. kind of powers. Uh, Trask himself contacts the X Men. He's yeah. just coming in on the Blackbird. He's like, X Men, come in. You know, like just all, just calls them up on the the Blackbird and tells them to come to the UN Peace Legion in Madripoor. And uh, he he tells Cyclops this kind of like code this kind of code stuff because mm-hmm. he's like, the lobby vending machine is never out of diet. <laughs> And I'm like, I thought that was that was funny and cool. Yeah, and I just I, w- I wish the scene just kept. Go- I, yeah, I just wish the scene kept going to Cyclops, but I'm not sure. And be like, listen, Cyclops, the horse is in the barn. Right, I Cyclops, I'm not following. Cyclops, the chicken is in the pot. And I'm like, I'm like I, the fucking vending machine's rigged for a secret door, you idiot. Like that, that kind of thing. It's never out of die. It's never out of die. <laughs> You know, kind of. It was good. <laughs> that was great. Uh, we have a C story here. Uh, another story that I don't really care too much about. Uh, Jubilee and Roberto. Do you want to talk about what Roberto and Jubilee are up to? Yes. So uh, she's kind of been on his uh, ass the entire time he's been on the team, uh, you know, because he's never told his parents that he is a mutant. Uh, he's always just, you know, I'm off at the, you know, vacation on the coast. Or I took mm-hmm. the boat out or, you know. And, right. So she's finally gave him you know, enough courage to, you know, you know, we're going to go tell your mom and dad. Of course, when they get there, her his father's not there, but her his mother is. And, you know, he kind of drops the bombshell. She's like, yeah, I kind of knew. Yeah. From knew. the time you were setting the place on fire, you <laughs> yeah. know, when you're eight you, years old, I kind of knew. You burned down like <laughs> six of our houses. We yeah. kind of put two and two together. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, 
So you think all is well, and then she's kind of, it goes a little bit sinister. She's like, well, we obviously can't tell anybody. Yeah, we got to bury this deep. And he's like, what? And she's like, you know, stockholders and whatnot or whatever, some kind of, you know, corporate. She's worried about the corporate image yeah, more the, than her yeah, son. exactly. And she wants him to kind of be discreet about who he's being seen with, right. I guess, so to speak. But that that's kind of our C story there. Uh, that's not doing enough for me at this point. That storyline, so yeah. maybe it'll pick up. I feel like we'll see more of it by the by season's end. But really, as far as all the plot threads we've got going right now, that's the one I'm least interested least concerned in. about. I would agree exactly. Um, Nightcrawler and the team end up finding Rogue. She kind of, uh, you know, they're kind of her Nightcrawler and Rogue kind of having a little little talk, and obviously there's like you know some the 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 way of what's been going on. She hasn't really kind of grieved Gambit's loss, so she kind of just. She sees the team there as well in Madripoor. She kind of collapses into to Nightcrawler's arms. Yeah. She kind of finally allows herself to to grieve. And uh, meanwhile, a mystery man uh, ends up suffocating uh, Guy Rich in a hospital bed. Yes, we don't see it. It was very. Uh, I was I was watching it last night, and it was it just kind of reminded me of. Uh, the uh, the scene in the Godfather Part Two where they kill uh, what's his face the old man oh, they, yeah, where they yeah. try to kill him in his hospital bed right, right. it just uh, it just reminded me of that a little bit uh, but the X Men head to the the building uh, I think it's Morph who uses the secret vending machine yeah it is Morph yeah <laughs> uh, they find a secret cybernetic facility and uh, some knocked out OZT guards. So uh, they also find Trask, who's out there just quoting Oppenheimer, like "I am death," and he's like out on the <laughs> out on the balcony, out on uh, about to jump, and he kind of reveals that OZT has been putting things in motion behind the scenes, and Mister Sinister is building a Sentinel more powerful than the one in Genosha. Uh, he jumps. He's 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 ready. He's had enough. He jumps, and Rogue initially saves him from mm-hmm. jumping. But uh, when he doesn't have any kind of more information to give her, she lets him drop. Yeah. And you're just like, well, damn. But we get it. I get it. You I know? think he says something like, you know, she questions him and he's like, I have nothing. And she's like, just me neither. Or something yeah, like something that. Something just like lets that. him go. And lets him drop. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone is kind of turned off by it except Wolverine, of course. Yeah. He's like, hell yeah. <laughs> I'd have done it. I'd have done it. <laughs> uh, turns out that Trash didn't die. He mutated into a human sentinel. Human sentinels that, uh, now, folks. Yeah, that t- is able to take out Rogue with one punch. Uh, the fight here and the action of this show, we've said it before, but the, the I mean, it's not a long fight, but it's top notch. It is good stuff. It yeah. looks great. It looks great. You know, them kind of f- sliding and falling. I like where like Wolverine's kind of sliding down the building. He's like, Summers! And like, you know, uh, Cyclops is trying to blast debris. Gene is like moving it me- yeah. uh, mentally with her mind. All top notch, stuff, yeah. top notch action here. Uh, the X Men are kind of getting their asses kicked until Cable shows up, and then we get a reveal. Jean kind of uh, uses her her powers, and it's kind of revealed to Scott that Cable is Nathan Summers from the future. Right, and he's like, "Well, we don't really don't really got time for this now, Dad. You know, <laughs> <laughs> shit's going down. More things to do right now, yeah. Dad." Uh, <laughs> Cable kind of reveals that Trask got it wrong, and Mister Sinister is working for someone else, someone worse. Uh, that's someone else, I'm going to be honest, not a character I'm super familiar with. I've heard the name before. I've seen the character depicted a couple times. But that someone else is Bastion, uh, a mutant sentinel, sentinel hybrid. Okay. Uh, what well, do you know about Bastion, Todd? Uh, just what, what you I, just, what told, what what you I just told me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I figured as much. He has an affinity for the song One-Eyed Purple People Eater, apparently. Yeah, in, in our last <laughs> scene, it's revealed that Magneto is actually alive, and he's, uh, he's being held... Uh, prisoner by Bastion in like an old rundown bar, mm-hmm. and uh, he's been outfitted with a power dampening collar. And uh, Magneto gets a straight razor shave from Bastion while uh, Sheb Woolley's flying purple people eater plays. Shaving, <laughs> dry. dry. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's kind of like a what the fuck moment, and it's like a little, it's weird and something that you wouldn't normally see in a kid show. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. It's like it's it's weird and like I love the use uh, through uh, episode five and this episode in episode seven the use of like real actual real world songs, licensed music, licensed yeah. music. Yeah. Like it just it adds an extra. I mean, we got that Disney money. Let's burn it, baby. Let's burn through it. Let's burn it, baby. <laughs> Even though I'm having my own problems right now with Disney, but uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's all it's all great stuff, and it, it, it's a little bit of that what the what the fuck moment. And again, I'm not gonna say I'm like a Bastion expert, but I know he's a mutant sitting on hybrid because that's what Google told me. <laughs> that's what Google told me. Ting ting. But he <laughs> looks interesting, and uh, you know, for him to be set up as we thought the whole season, you know, so far, Mister Sinister was gonna be the big bad, but now there's actually someone 
uh, worse. We've got a new player in the game. And this also ties into you know, some of that future tech, what's going on. So it also gives a good explanation for all the, the time traveling mischief that's going on with cable being involved with that cybernetics lab that they, they found that's got way more advanced technology and cybernetics than is currently available right. in the timeline the X Men are in or yeah. the time the X Men are in. So again, pretty strong episode, Todd. What did uh what did you think? What's your review score for episode seven? Uh, you know, I really like this one. I'm going to bump her back up to an eight. I thought it was a great episode. You know, a little weird, a little kooky, a uh, solid eight. Uh, uh, Captain America, hey. <laughs> yeah, true. He's still looking for that shield. Still looking for that He's shield. Like, what the fuck is He's it? He's still digging through the snow for that shield. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'm with you. I'm a little bit. Um, I think it's a good episode. I give it a seven out of ten overall. I think it's good. I think it's solid. Again, you know, it's a little roller coaster this season. Some of the scores are. Obviously, we go ten for right. me. For me, ten, six, seven. You know, we're kind of we're kind of roller coastering just a little bit. But again, we're still dealing with the fallout of a big episode. Episode five was intended to be uh, the kind of the mid season finale, so to speak. True. So you, you you expect a kind of a ramp down to a ramp back up as we we approach right. the last three episodes of the season. But it's still, I think it's a strong episode. We're obviously moving the plot along. We now have. Our big bad revealed for the season, and we'll see where it goes in the last three episodes. I'm really hoping, honestly, that we we don't get a lot of resolution, so to speak, in the last three. I feel like if you wrap everything in up in the last three episodes, you're going to rush it too much. I feel a cliffhanger coming. Yeah, a big cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that would be about right. I mean, you know, some people would argue maybe not. It won't be as satisfactory, but I don't. I don't want to see them rush through all this in the last three episodes. This, There's too much to tie up right now. I think. Yeah, like I would hope the performance of the show. I I don't. I haven't looked into it and heard much about it. But I would hope the performance of the show should be strong enough that it's getting a season two. If not, it should be. I don't know if it's being greenlit for season two. I haven't looked it up. Maybe in the next time we talk about the last three, we'll, we'll know uh, by the end or uh, go back and find out if it was. But I mean, I would hope we're getting a season two. And I don't want them to like do the thing where like you know you you make a, a season of like ten episodes and they're like all right we'll greenlight you for 26 no <laughs> i want us to still keep around 10 episodes yeah. like i still want more thought out more in more depthful stories i don't want like the syndication 26 episode yeah run. exactly yeah. i want like 10 episodes is about right for something like this that's fine but yeah i hope we get a season two and but i hope the last three episodes of this doesn't just like rush through all this shit and bastion's just laying defeated at the end of this season like i don't want that like yeah. i would i want some satisfactory ends to some of these storylines and some catharsis. Um, you know, somebody got to get their ass kicked. Maybe Sinister. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, leave me some threads and, and leave me wanting more. That's what I hope for for the rest of the season. Exactly, yeah. Uh, any other overall thoughts, Todd, before we wrap it up here? Just uh, I'm enjoying the hell out of this series. This is as excited I've, as I've been for a superhero property in, I'd say, a pretty good while. Yeah. So uh, I keep it coming. Yeah, I say, yeah, exactly. Keep it coming, Disney. It's top copyright claiming my fucking stuff, all right? <laughs> yeah. We're not making no money off your stuff. We, we's broke. We, we's broke, and we promoting <laughs> your stuff you got coming out, all right? Stop <laughs> copyright claiming our shit, all right? Uh, so, Todd, you want to tell everyone how they can find us and get in touch with us on social media? We are at Tail Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Tail Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at tailcapespod at gmail.com. Uh, if you enjoy the show, please consider leaving a like on the video and subscribing to the channel. Be on the lookout for this week's Popcorn Mumbles. We'll be talking about the 2014 film Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Tao Capes will return next week. We want to thank you so much for listening. Until next time, bye, guys. Later, guys. I can't feel you. <laughs>